Hello again, my name is Ernest Mino. Let's settle for the details now. And government has urged strict adherence to containment measures in the fight against COVID-19 with emphasis on the wearing of masks. Addressing the latest press briefing on the country's case situation, Health Minister Kwekwajman Mino advised Kenyans to change their attitude towards the pandemic, warning COVID-19 might never leave us or go away, but can be kept at bay if people adhere to the approved preventive measures. HIV AIDS came, we have never been able to take it off, we still live with it. H1N1 is still around, we live with it. There are several other diseases that we live with. Non-communicable diseases, they don't get spreading and they are not infectious. But when you get it, you live with it. And the word that we all use is managing to live with the disease. So if you are diabetic, they will ask you to take some medications, depending on your body chemistry, some milligrams once a day or twice a day. In some instances, you have to inject insulin into your body. That is how you live with diabetes. Hypertension, we live with it. So now, the fact is, coronavirus has been with us, so they call this one novel, new. And for the past three or four months, the world is living with it. The impact is severe, very, very severe elsewhere, because people are dying in numbers. Here in our country, we are now seeing community spread, but we are not dying. Dr. Badu Sakodia will come and give you numbers again. Our death rate is quite, quite, quite low. That does not mean that we should allow ourselves to be infected with the disease. So what we have to do now is to live with it and manage ourselves against it. So what should we do? So far, there is no medication that we can take. There is no vaccine that we can actually get to vaccinate ourselves against the virus. But there are certain things that we know we can do to protect ourselves. One of them is what I'm wearing. So we are managing to reduce the spread. We will have to find a way to ensure that the numbers don't go up, but they begin to come down and come down and come down. So many of us are talking unnecessarily. And if you are infected, you open your mouth and the virus comes out. So again, if you don't need to talk, don't talk. Especially when you don't have the mask. They are telling us that we shouldn't even laugh. Especially when you don't have the mask. And the Information Minister Kojo Pongkuma warns the country's increasing case counts should give cause for worry to compel everyone to keep him or herself protected without mention. On Tuesday when we gave an update, one of the major hotspots was the Ashanti region and specifically Obuasi, where we had recorded about 200 new cases or 270 or so new cases around that particular area. This morning, there's a team from the Ghana Health Service that is uh, in Kumasi heading to Obuasi um, to step up the containment efforts there. If technology does not fail us, we'll try to connect to them in Kumasi for them to give us a quick update on what they are seeking to do uh, out there. Um, we also have a quick update. Uh, close of business last night around 11 p.m. and the numbers that are available, Dr. Bedusa Akodia would share those with us. But first, the Minister responsible for health has an advisory on community spread. The numbers, as you are seeing, should give you cause for concern, and he has an advisory on community spread, which he will share with us. 
And that's the information minister, Kojo Pongkuma, will bring you details of what he said in a subsequent bulletins by the director of public health at the Ghana Health Service, Dr. Bedu Sako. They also gave us a breakdown of the cases. And as we know it, uh, there are 122 uh, new cases, bringing the case count to 5,530. But the tourism minister, Barbara Otengesi, has been emphasizing that the directive for drinking bars and clubs to remain closed is still in force. Now, this follows uh, an earlier statement from the Ghana Tourism Authority, which gave the green light to drinking bars to operate alongside hotels and restaurants. We'll hear from the tourism minister shortly, but let, let's return and hear from the director of public health, Dr. Bedu Sankodia, on Ghana's case count. From the last briefing, the new cases confirmed that added to what we reported uh, 122, with the distributions in Greater Accra, 57, Shanti Region, 62, Central Region, 2, and Western North, 1. Uh, two more new deaths were added up, bringing the death toll to 24, with 24 deaths among 5,530 cases. The death to positivity rate, which we term as the case fatality rate, stands at 0.43% for the country. Um, the total number of recoveries have increased, and indeed we have done quite a significant number of people having done the first uh, test which is negative, and you are waiting for the second test to declare them Recovered, fully recovered. And the total number of recoveries as of now stands at 674. And let's stay on COVID-19 because residents of Sunyane in the Bona region are calling for a beefing up of security at the Ghana-Côte d'Ivoire border days after the region recorded its first coronavirus case, which was imported from neighboring uh, Ivory Coast. The people suggest that the use of nose masks should also be made mandatory to limit the spread of the pandemic to other parts of the region. Our regional correspondent, Anasabit, reports. A few days ago, the Bono region recorded its first COVID-19 case. It was a Togolese national who got into the country through the German North District from La Côte d'Ivoire who brought in this particular uh, case. Now, days after the region recorded its first case, how are the people here reacting to the news of uh, the first ever recorded case of uh, COVID-19 here in the Bono region? We are speaking to some residents here to have their view on how they reacted to that particular news. It was our prayer that we will not record a case here in the region, that the case has been imported and we were shocked at the news. We never heard of a case here and so we were protecting ourselves. So when we heard of the new case here, we were really shocked. With regards to the enforcement of the nose mask, uh, a few others we've spotted on the streets are without the nose mask. The excuse being given from the people is that they complain that uh, there's heat whenever they are on the nose mask and others are also of the view that uh, they find it difficult to breathe whenever they are on the nose mask. So uh, the usage of the nose mask is not as expected here in Sunyani. Oh, see those who are not using the masks say it is because of the heat. But for us as drivers, we make sure you have it on before we set off. They say it's hot and you cannot breathe too. But I'm pleading on everyone to have it on so we all protect ourselves. The people we've been speaking with are suggesting that uh, law enforcement agencies should enhance their enforcement of the use of the nose mask as well as other directives related to the prevention of the COVID-19. It will be very helpful when enforced because those who do not put them on quickly wear them upon seeing the security forces or the military. 
And how about the Ghana Cote d'Ivoire border? The people have the view that border patrols should be enhanced to ensure that more cases are not imported into the country from neighboring La Côte d'Ivoire. A lot of the people are around the people and Doma, and some of these people get into Doma through the bushes. So the border patrols should be enforced to keep that. I am pleading on authorities to check our bodies. That is where the problem is, and when sealed, we won't record new cases. Well, there are still some few others here in the Bono region who are still doubting the reality of the COVID-19 case. They are the view that it is actually not real that we are recording cases here in the country. I had a chat with some tenants in my house and they were saying that it's never true that the COVID-19 is in the country. They say what's happening abroad are being shown on TV for us to see. But it's not seen here in the country, so until they see the dead on TV, they won't believe it. According to them, it's just a hoax. From Sunyani here in the Bono region, I am an Asabit for joining us. From the Bono region, let's move to the Ashanti region because Council of State Chairman Dasi Broto Seribor II is employing chiefs in his traditional area and other parts of the country to find local methods of improving adherence to COVID-19 protocols. The call comes in the wake of the country's increasing case counts, which has now crossed the 5,000 mark. Nana Oto Seribor, who is also head of the job in traditional council, warns of potential danger if community spread worsens. Nana Ojima has the rest of the story. In spite of spike in numbers of persons testing positive to the virus, many people are still apathetic to preventive protocols. There are those who even think COVID-19 is either non-existent or it's nothing to worry about. Yeah, with fragile nature of health systems, especially in rural areas, Nana Otio believes intensified efforts is needed to curb the spread. Registrar for the Jaben Traditional Council, Kweku Ankoma Asari, speaks for him. Um, Nano Utwesrebo, in one of his statements, said that uh, the disease that is affecting us now, it doesn't have legs to travel anywhere. It's we, really the citizens or the people who will carry them to wherever that we have to carry them. So our humble appeal to the general public, especially Jabemai and its citizens, is that they should stay put and stay home. If you don't have anything very important to do, it's advisable that we stay put. The traditional authority has donated personal protective equipment and other supplies to Jaben Government Hospital. They included 4,000 pairs of hand gloves, 500 surgical face masks, and 120 boxes of hand sanitizer, among others. Medical superintendent of Jaben Hospital, Dr. Kofi Bua Bosk Hamilton, received the items. Coronavirus has come at a time which caused everybody unprepared. We did not budget for this. And these things are used all the time and they need replacement. So today we are very happy and glad that our own traditional council and Nana Utro uh, Sribo have found it necessary to come and help support us. Nana Ojima reporting. 
And with Ghana's COVID-19 cases inching towards 6,000, scientists are emphasizing the need to know the impact of the country's response to the pandemic. That requires development of artificial intelligence to study common patterns among countries and classify them according to the spread of infection. A Ghanaian scientist has lived up to the challenge by developing the technology to determine the country's COVID-19 peak. On Tech Thursday, Love FM's Kwesi Debra speaks with Dr. Mark Amobuatin of the University of Energy and Natural Resources in Sunyani. I looked at what was happening in Ghana, then I realized that Ghana were part of the group that is still emerging. Okay, so the coronavirus is still rising and hasn't peaked yet. And truly, if you look at Ghana, our cases, we've been doubling our cases almost every week. I think we've been good at that. Every week we, we try and double our cases. Uh, so I, I wanted to make sure that the AI is not um, biased. So I went and I looked at the different charts, okay, the data behind the scenes, and I compared it. And then probably I'll show you, right? Ghana was just on the, like, on the mean in all the countries. We are just following the curve, and it actually proved that um, we are not there. My name is Dr. Mark Amobuatin. I'm a lecturer at the University of Energy and Natural Resources. I'm also the head for the Earth Observation Research and Innovation Center of the university. AI Country Monitor um, is to help objectively know what is happening in each country. So since the coronavirus came, um, there have been lots of statistics. People have been trying to look at um, the confirmed cases, the recovery rates, and the number of deaths. But each country is unique. The dynamics are unique. Um, but I realize that since it's a pandemic and we are humans, we might respond in some unique ways. So the best thing was to try and look at patterns within it. And since everything was difficult, I tried to say, okay, let me see if I can use AI, artificial intelligence, to analyze the data that is coming and try to group the countries together. So that's why um, I did so. I developed an AI and it was looking as of now, just looking at the confirmed cases. And by looking at the confirmed cases, it's grouping the countries into three. Okay, so those that are emerging, that is the coronavirus is still rising, it hasn't peaked yet. Those that are at their peak and they are able to control it, and those that have overcome the coronavirus itself. So that's the three things. And it's, it's an automatic process. Why is that? that um, it updates itself um, every 24 hours. But since not much changes happen, I decided to just push the updates every week. The AI pulls data from the GitHub, that's um, of the John Hopkins University. They compile data from World Health Organization and, and other sources, and they update it, for, I think, once a day. So the AI pulls the data, then it pre-processes it and analyzes the patterns within the data, looking at the past 100 days. Then it compares it to what is happening over the train period. Then, based on that, it tries to classify um, by probability what each country is doing. So that's um, basically how it does it. Um, it's using um, a concept which we call convolution, okay, or convolution neural networks, and that's basically the same technology we use in identifying um, people in images. And And based on my initial test and analysis, the AI is around 90.05% accurate. Okay, and, and I've compared the results to there's another um, university trying to do something similar, but they are analyzing the R nodes, and it's just for a few countries. And um, they have totally, like you can see that there are some cases they are totally different. Yeah. But if you look at the graphs, you realize that AI is actually doing a far better job and it's providing results for the whole, the whole world. Every state that is reporting data, um, the AI provides it. And the analysis is also quite fast. It just happens within about 30 seconds or so, every country is diagnosed. The models are accurate as the data that has, um, is being reported. 
Okay, so if a country ceases to report data over a long time, um, it would it will show that they are they are let's say they are peaked. Okay, they are not getting any cumulative cases. So if they um, it's going to say that this country is doing well or it's not doing well. So the tool is working very effectively, and um, in the future, I'm looking at not just the coronavirus, but you know, countries report all sorts of data, and this can be an effective way of analyzing each data that every country is, is reporting. And you always want to stay with your most credible news source, Joy News. Let's bring you some other stories away from COVID-19. The 27-year-old man who allegedly physically abused his three-year-old son is in court today. We'll take you to court for the latest on this case. But before that, the Department of Social Welfare in the Ashanti region has taken over uh, the case in which the three-year-old boy has been hospitalized after his dad whipped him for bedwetting. The department is engaging the services of a psychologist to observe and counsel the victim and his mother. A social development officer for the Kumasi office of the Department of Social Welfare, uh, Godfred Adbo Adbogo, tells Loud News the department will foot the medical bills of the victim. We had the opportunity of speaking with um, the medical team, um, Dr. Kokotete. She's doing a very good job for the boy. We saw the lacerations, we saw the, the serious uh, injuries that were caused as a result of the beating and whatever the father had inflicted on the child. So physical evidence of um, uh, grievous abuse. His back was damaged. Um, had some swells as a result of the the, um, the trauma he's gone through, the child um, is, resp is responding to treatment, and the child um, so far, uh, medically, uh, uh, the doctor says that he is fit for discharge, but they don't want to observe for some cause. They they shuttling him between the surgical ward and the children's ward. So, looking at the child situation now, since Sunday. The doctors have done a good job to at least um, fix whatever issue that has happened. We asked the hospital to, co to continue maintaining whatever they are doing to keep the child stable, to keep the child on admission as well, then also to keep the child for at least a week and observe while we look at the situation surrounding it. We spoke with the mother. The mother corroborated it, but the mother sounded um, very disturbed because uh, apparently the mother seems to have an idea that uh, the guy who did that to the child wasn't mentally sound because of his previous activities and behaviors. Um, so we were curious about that position, so we decided to also pay a visit to the Meshia Dovsu, the police station to ascertain things for ourselves. We got there and um, he admitted the offense. Yeah, of um, the the perpetrator, that's the child's biological father who caused that injury. He admitted offence, but said he snapped. Apparently, said he wasn't well. That he works. He's a national service person. In fact, a university graduate from one of the the public institutions in Ghana, and he's doing his national service in Accra. Uh, according to him, that uh, he was not acting well, so he was advised by his HR to seek help. He thought it was a spiritual uh, issue, so he decided to come uh, over to Kumasi. And from his narrative, um, he suggests that some pastors have even prayed for him because once there was something uh, comes over him and he acts abnormally, and that's the reason why he was in Kumasi. And when he came, he had his this son with this lady, and he decided to spend some time with the the boy. He said he doesn't know what happened, even though the child had been bedwet and had been urinating uh, in bed, but he snapped on that occasion and meted those wounds to the child. He says he regrets and he will not give an opportunity, he will not repeat his actions again. At this point, what decision or what support services and is the social welfare promising or pledging at this moment? So at this point, uh, the department um, through the regional director has directed that 
the child should maintain should, should be kept at the facility for at least a week the department is uh, liaising with a, a psychologist at uh, the governor teaching hospital to be brought in to speak to the the child and her mother because the mother looked visibly troubled and needs we need some counseling the department has asked the hospital through the the medical team not to charge the medical bills in that regard and um, the department is making recommendations to uh, report to uh, our national office so that if there are any immediate assistance that may be required to assist uh, the lady going forward same will be done but for the meantime we are absorbing the the medical bills we are also uh, keeping a close eye on this child while she's she remain the custody of the um, the mother and at the hospital facility and we are liaising with uh, a psychologist to handle the, the lady and the small boy even though the small boy is, 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 is he's agile he's responding to uh, treatment he's 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 roaming around fine he's but he will need to be sure because he seems to understand his environment and he speaks audibly so whatever he's gone through we will need to introduce the the, the psychic part of to see whether we can um as it were, restore him to where he was before this unfortunate incident. And so, like I did indicate, uh, John News is in court on this very issue. We are following very keenly. Uh, we'll speak to our reporter who is there in our subsequent bulletins, but he has some uh, details emerging from court. We know that the accused has pleaded not guilty to the charges of assault and causing harm. Uh, his lawyer has also put in a request for bail which the prosecutors objecting to saying that the bill application uh, would put the mother of the victim and the victim himself also in danger. Uh, the prosecutor says this will be a threat uh, on their lives, will put a threat to them as well. And we understand that uh, the accused person is in court, uh, very calm throughout the sitting. Before then, there are, before the proceedings started, our reporter engaged the family uh, to find out exactly uh, what they know, what they can say about this person. Now, the family says that he is quite uh, a calm person, and uh, he is also someone who keeps to himself most of the time. Uh, they notice, however, some changes in his behavior after he... Uh, got an opportunity, a huge employment opportunity, and started interviews and presentation. They describe him as very quiet, keeps to himself, but also very brilliant academically. And so uh, they have been, they are actually surprised at this behavior. And we know that uh, the victim's lawyer is lawyer Kodria. Uh, let's go on to the phone lines now. Erastos Asari Donko joins us. Erastos, you have been in court. You're following this very keenly. Uh, tell us more about this person. The family is saying that uh, he is rather calm and keeps to himself. He's pleaded not guilty. Tell us more. Well, he pleaded not guilty, and um, the lawyer had tried to use the biblical transformation of Saul to Paul, indicating that if uh, this gentleman is allowed and given a chance, he will be a saint to preach the word against abuse. But uh, the judge then suspended sentence for a while, went to her chambers and came back. Now, what she has decided is that due to the coronavirus pandemic and the need to decongest the prison, uh, she cannot uh, uh, remand the accused person, but has to give bail uh, to the tune of 30,000 uh, Ghana cities with three sureties to be justified. And so that's the decision of the court. The guy has been given uh, a bail, and he, he has been also asked to stay away uh, from the child and his mother. It is interesting that the lawyer is saying that if given the opportunity, his client will be a preacher against uh, child abuse and yet pleaded uh, not guilty on, on, on the, to these counts. Uh, but tell us about the demeanor of the... Uh, the victim, also that's the mother, and also the accused person in court? Well, uh, the, the mother is not re really happy. In fact, she stormed out of the court and uh, was very angry. Uh, I tried to speak with her. She said no. She was almost in tears and wouldn't want to speak to anybody. Uh, what the brother 
rather is talking to us about is that they do not believe that the lady uh, and her uh, child are safe uh, once this uh, gentleman is out there. And so they, they are not too happy with the decision of the court. But I have uh, lawyer Kudia with me here. Uh, let me try to find out. Of course, if the mother is a very mother, no mother will be pleased with what happened to the son. But this is a matter that borders on the liberties of an individual, named the father and the accused person hearing. The law also respects the liberties and the fundamental rights of the accused person and that of the victim and the victim's mother. There were arguments from the prosecution and myself. At the end of the day, the court realized that it was, there was some water in what I was saying. So whether she's angry or not, she can be angry because of what happened to her son, but she cannot be angry with the court. Clearly, um, it wasn't because, perhaps because of your argument, but the judge clearly said that, well, because of the coronavirus pandemic, um, she wouldn't want to remand the uh, accused person uh, uh, you know, for him to contract, possibly, uh, in, in court. That, that was the reason. How do you feel about that? Yes, it was as a result. The reason didn't come here. The reason didn't come out of the blue. It was as a result of the submissions I made. That might have prompted her to come out with a further reasoning. Because, you know, you don't just send somebody to prison just because he has been accused of an offence. The best time to send somebody to prison is when the matter has been finished with when the proof has been beyond reasonable doubt, then you can send the person to jail. He's not guilty. Uh, clearly, he has also been admitting uh, that, yes, um, he beat the boy. How do you just oppose the two? He, has to, he admitted to you that he beat the boy, but in court he denied it. And that is what I'm following. As an officer of the court, I don't listen to you. I don't base my arguments on hearsay. What he told you could best be hearsay. But what is on record is that he has denied that he did it. And based on the, uh, the court went ahead and granted him this. So that's what you're going to defend next in court? Yes. If the afterthoughts, the other acts or inactions or certain events come up, you can go ahead and then find a way of settling the matter. Even though, because it's, let's not forget, there's a father, a son, and a supposed girlfriend mother in this matter. So it's a sort of family affair. We can find our way out when he decides to make overtures to the other side. But in court, the facts are that he pleaded no guilty. So, lawyer Kodia there uh, speaking to us. He's the uh, counsel for the accused person. Thank you. Uh, we have the prosecutor read out the case uh, in court. Are the facts any different from what we know, from what you have reported? Or are there extra, uh, is there any extra information that has come up in court? No, clearly, uh, those uh, are the same facts that were given uh, in court, except the age of the accused, uh, which was given at 25 instead of 30. Uh, aside the age, it, it, it clearly, um, the facts of the case are just as we have reported it. Uh, that was how the prosecutor uh, said it in court. So currently, we are waiting for uh, the family to meet the uh, bail bond. So the suspect is still in there inside the courtroom, handcuffed, and uh, the family is also looking at ways to get, uh, you know, the, to meet the bill bound. 30,000 uh, Ghana cities with three charities, that is uh, the, the, the bill sum. When is the next court sitting? Uh, a week today, so we are talking about 21st of this month, and the judge stated that she wants this case dealt with immediately, and so She's asked the prosecutor to furnish the court with all the necessary documents. And if by the third date, when they meet, the prosecution has done its job, uh, she wants to go ahead straight away and deal with this particular case. Your Honor, just before you go, the mother of the boy has been speaking to you. Can you share with us uh, what she said? In fact, she could not utter a word to me. She was in tears. Mm. And she told me uh, that she, like from her demeanor, she did not like what happened in court. Uh, and her brother is the one who is telling me that her sister feels unsafe with the gentleman out there. And she feels that uh, this gentleman can do something to her at any time. 
that's what the brother has been telling us. And finally, I understand that the court is adhering to social distancing strictly. I can tell you that um, you see the long queue uh, in court, three people sit on, on that long queue, nothing more, nothing less, and uh, the other people will have to sit outside. The judge herself is in a nose mask, and uh, all other officers in the court are also in a nose mask. Strict enforcement of the uh, social distancing and face mask protocols. You asked us. Thank you very much for bringing us up to speed on this case. And definitely, I know you are following this. Uh, we'll bring listeners up to speed. We have more on this for you at midday. We're taking a break here on News Text. We'll return with more stories. Thanks for staying with us here on News Desk. Let's bring you some very interesting developments in the eastern region. The paramount chief of the Manya Krobo traditional area, Nene Sakte II, has this to the paramount queen for the area, Nana Aplam II, for her recent marriage to a man from a Manya division, one of the seven divisions that claim to have severed ties with the paramount chief of the area. Now, source is close to the Manya Krobo paramount. He say the uh, paramount chief before a meeting of chiefs and elders of the area on Monday, that's May 11, announced the immediate distillment of the queen mother for the area. My colleague, uh, Kofi Siang, joins us via phone with more on this. Kofi, first tell us about this queen mother. Who is she? What kind of person is she? Well, this queen mother was, uh, you saw the queen mother of the area sometime in 2015, and he's been working with the paramount chief of the area uh, since she was installed. She's been a very cooperative uh, person, and the people in the area like her so much. So uh, she's somebody who was installed uh, the queen mother, the paramount queen mother of the area uh, some five years ago. Uh, what can you say about the role she's played uh, in the paramountcy and in the area at large? Okay, um, I can tell you that she's somebody who is development-oriented. Mm. Uh, he leads well with political leaders in the area, and she's brought some development to the area as well. So uh, if you speak to most of the chiefs and the residents there, they will tell you that uh, she's somebody that they would always wish to work with. So I recall you brought us a story about a division, uh, seven ties with the paramountcy the, uh, of Manya traditional area. Now tell us about this group of people and who exactly is married to the queen mother in this case. Okay, um, so about six of the divisional chiefs in the area, they, they are seven in all. So six of them sometime in October, uh, last year, uh, decided to cut ties with the paramount chief of the area, Nene Sakiti, okay. uh, the second. According to them, uh, what they say is that the chief is a dictator. He is someone who has gone against some traditional values and customs in the area, so they wouldn't want to work with him again. So they decided to cut ties with him and to elevate themselves to uh, individual paramount. So. Uh, that has been the story since uh, last year, October 2019. And uh, who is the Queen Mother married to as we speak? Okay, uh, so the story is that the Queen Mother of the area decided to get married to uh, one legal pra practitioner from one of the divisions in the area that cut ties with the chief. So mm. the uh, paramount chief who wasn't satisfied with the decision of the Queen Mother, even though it's her right, decided that, well, she's betrayed him, so he wouldn't want to continue to work with him again. So, uh, to continue to work with her again. So, uh, she announced before the traditional leaders in the area, including the chiefs and the other sub uh, queen mothers in the area, that uh, he's destroyed the queen mother henceforth. When did this marriage take place? Uh, it took place. Uh, sometime in February this year. In February this year. Uh, yeah. Do you know of any form of consultation since February till now? And even before that marriage, was she uh, encouraged or discouraged to go on with the, with the marriage? Well, was she engaged? Well, this, news, this news of uh, her disagreement and the marriage uh, mm -hmm. is coming to some of us as a surprise because 
uh, we never heard of any kind of disagreement between the Queen Mother and the Paramount Chief with regards to the fact that the Queen Mother uh, has decided to, you know, marry from one of the divisions that do not, uh, you know, want to work with the uh, Paramount Chief again. So uh, the news came about as a surprise to many uh, of us and some of the residents in the area. So we, we for now, cannot tell uh, whether there has been some consultations or not, or whether the Paramount Chief at the point had disagreed uh, with the Queen Mother's marriage to the legal practitioner who hails from one of the divisions in the area. So it's coming as a surprise to you know most of us, and especially the residents in the Menya uh, division. Two quick things before you go. What has been the reaction of the Queen and the people? Well, I tried speaking to the Queen yesterday, and I wasn't successful, so I spoke to the PRO of the Menya Crop of Traditional Council, Nene Asadaho, and he wasn't able to confirm to me or deny uh, whether the instrument is valid or not. But what he says is that uh, they are still consulting and they will arrive at this, a decision which will be communicated to the public uh, in due course. Kofi Sian, thank you very much for bringing us this uh, update in the uh, Manya traditional area, the Manya Kobo traditional area. The chief there has this to the Paramount Queen Mother. We'll bring you more in our subsequent bulletins. Up next is business. Morning. Welcome to business. My name is Daryl Powell. Tourism Minister Barbara Otin JC has emphasized that drinking bars and clubs remain closed. This follows an earlier statement uh, from the Ghana Tourism Authority, which gave a clearance for drinking bars and uh, nightclubs to operate. Here's uh, the minister briefing the press today at the COVID 19 briefing. The Ghana Tourism Authority, per directives issued to the hospitality industry, inadvertently eased up the restrictions applicable to the industry by indicating that food chains and restaurants could operate sit-down services by observing social distancing protocols. It was also indicated that drinking bars could operate and also comply with social distancing protocols but nightclubs would remain closed. However, we wish to clarify that further to the directive of His Excellency the President regarding the extension of the ban on public gatherings, the status quo remains the same, which means that bars, drinking bars and nightclubs remain closed. They cannot operate. Food chains and restaurants, including restaurants in hotels, can operate takeout and delivery services. This means that you can go to the food chain like Papaya or KFC, order your food and carry it away and have a meal in your home. Or you could go to a restaurant, order a meal and carry it away. On the other hand, you could also take advantage where they have delivery services to place a phone call, order your meal and it will be delivered to you at home and you can enjoy your meal. So this is a clarification that we want to um, bring to the public and to the industry, and we hope that they'll ensure compliance with this, these clarifications. And that's your business update for now.